Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon or good evening. Um, if you are joining us from different time zones from around the world. My name is Martin Welisch and I'm from the Innovation Cell of the UN Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. Welcome to the World Data Forum panel on strengthening peace and security data analytics. This uh, panel is jointly organized with our colleagues from the UN Department of uh, Peace Operations. And it is the first time that both departments participate in the World Data Forum. And we are very thankful to the program committee to have admitted us. And uh, this event today stands kind of symbol for the great urgency of paying more attention to data in international affairs. In, in the recently submitted common agenda of the Secretary General, the SD highlighted the quintet of change for the United Nations 2.0, including innovation, data, strategic foresight, results orientation, and behavioral science. And in this very spirit, this session today will focus on how we can more effectively use data in the context of peace and security, especially in the context of prevention, peace mediation, peacekeeping, and peace building. Uh, in the peace and security pillar of the United Nations, we are exploring new applications and approaches to measure and forecast and advance peace. And in that very context, the uh, innovation cell over the last two years has introduced new approaches to, for instance, digital dialogues, uh, geospatial analysis, and predictive analytics. And to give you an example, we, we are analyzing much more systematically social media to understand political discourse or the absence thereof. And we are, for instance, also unpacking diplomatic language through machine learning to detect international tensions at scale. Or to give you another example, we are applying more systematically, not just state of the art, but really innovative ways of geospatial analysis to predict water shortages and address climate security as part of our prevention work. And in all of that, we have seen an uptick of a growing data for peace community. And I think the pandemic has um, the world more data literate, has made the world more data literate. Uh, think about you know, the term or the terminology flattening the curve uh, that is much more understood now than uh, you know, 18 months ago. And new technologies, and I think the, the fact that we're having this meeting in a virtual setting have become the new normal. And it's very hard to imagine a future without data and technology as we use it today for, for diplomacy. Uh, we are very delighted to have two scholars with us uh, to ignite a dialogue today in this uh, conversation about the status quo and the future of data-driven analysis to better sustain peace. And this event also marks the launch of the Peace and Security Data Hub, a joint initiative in response to the Secretary General's data strategy. Now, I have the pleasure to hand over to my colleague, Christina Goodness, the Chief of the Information Management Unit of the Departments of Political and Peace Building Affairs and Peace Operations. Over to you, Christina. Thank you, Martin, and welcome to our speakers, Lava and Plina, and welcome to all of the participants that are connecting remotely. Uh, to supplement and add on to what Martin has said, essentially the Peace and Security Data Hub, which we're hoping to launch today, is is. Oh, Christina, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I hope that our Peace and Security Data Hub, which all of you that are connecting remotely can access now if you point to the QR code that should appear on your screen and you connect, can connect to the website now. This is essentially the peace and security pillars coming to the table, so to speak, to the open data community, which we hope to continue to contribute to over the coming months and years. Uh, we really welcome the feedback from all parties so that we can use this platform, this platform in the World Data Forum, the ongoing dialogues that we have um, individually with organizations and colleagues, um, and using this open data platform, the Peace and Security Data Hub, to essentially answer these larger questions that we know we have to answer with more modernized and fuller sets of data, such as unpacking the subnational dynamics of political environments and understanding political gamesmanship. 
predicting the risks and predicting patterns of violence and, and when violence is used essentially as a political tool um, by elites or by the powerful and how that adds to the conversation on stability overall. And essentially answering these larger questions using sets of data that no one set is gonna answer everything. So we're talking about integrating different bodies of evidence and using this platform, we hope the Peace and Security Data Hub as a starting point in this larger dialogue with member states, uh, with civil society, and essentially with all of you that are attending and have taken the time to, to participate today. So grateful to enter the table. We've had a crack technical team to get this project off the board. And I want to give a shout out to the team that developed it in DPPA and DPO. And we're hoping to get more of our colleagues in the peace and security pillar and the wider sense to join us so that we can continue answering these questions together and showing that the UN, which was an innovation in and of itself when it was born, continues to be a vibrant and robust tool in the international community. I think we're gonna turn to uh, the a, a broader introduction and then a demonstration, as Martin said. So maybe back to you, Martin. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Christina. And uh, also a shout out to all colleagues. And some of you are here in this uh, meeting that have contributed to the Data Hub, colleagues from the Security Council Affairs Division, Palestinian Rights Division, uh, our colleagues in the Department of Peace Operation, and so forth. This was a great collaborative effort and, and just the beginning to really you know, connect the dots a bit better. Now, with that said, we're going to play a video clip with the greetings from both uh, Under Secretary Generals um, of both departments. Um, I, I, I think there might be a little bit of a streaming challenge, depending on where you are in the world. We tested it uh, just before that session, so we will also make sure that the link to the video clip will be circulated later, uh, but we give it a try. So I turn over to my colleague Joanna, who will play the video clip with the greetings and then do a live demo of the Data Hub before we turn to our um, um, panelists. Over to you, Jonathan. Data helps us make sense of this ever-changing world. We need it for the prevention of conflict, efforts towards sustaining peace, and measuring the impact of our work. The Peace and Security Data Hub contains information on peace agreements, peace-building projects, the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, Security Council practices, and other related issues. The Data Hub is a central repository for our activities and makes UN data more accessible as a public good. Our aim is to put data front and center. The Hub is a critical starting point for an upgrade of our analytical capacity. The Hub also provides examples that explain how we use data for better analysis, planning, and decision-making. We're already putting data to work looking at geospatial data related to water issues to improve prevention efforts, establishing indicators to measure gender mainstreaming, and considering political economy factors to assess state fragility and other data points. Data is playing an increasingly significant role in peacekeeping. Making good decisions means making informed decisions. The Peace and Security Data Hub project responds to those goals by supporting knowledge-based dialogue with member states and partners on critical questions in peacekeeping. We can strengthen the safety of our troops, progress on our protection agendas, and the impact of women in peace processes. At the same time, we are leveraging new technologies and forward-thinking solutions. The outcomes we want to see are improved situational awareness resulting from peacekeeping data, more engagement with partners, and increased use of data by peacekeepers. For this data to be genuinely used and harnessed, we have done our best to ensure that the Peace and Security Data Hub is an easy-to-use tool for anyone working for peace. It is meant for everyday use which is why it was built based on the needs of the users, especially in the field. The Peace and Security Data Hub is, however, only the beginning of our journey towards more informed decision-making. 
Visit the Peace and Security Data Hub website and explore the ways in which it can make a difference in our work. Okay. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I hope that wasn't too loud, and I hope that the video was accessible. I'm going to be showing you the Peace and Security Data Hub. I will be doing this with a number of different windows once my start bar appears, although it looks like it has disappeared. So let's see what we can do despite this. Okay, so before I dive in, I would like to um, just reiterate that the Peace and Security Data Hub is a jointly built um, platform between the two departments of DPPA and DPO at the United Nations. We wanted it to be spring-like, inviting, and easy to use. It is also a deliverable on the Secretary General's data strategy. Um, and in fact, exactly as mentioned in the video, this was built with the user's needs in mind. And one of the things that we were trying to address uh, with this data hub was the way in which we share data both with each other and with the public. So to avoid sending data around in ways that were not necessarily um, quick or to, um, sustainable or secure, we have pulled together this Peace and Security Data Hub. Um, the site is public. We will drop the link where we can, and it is also available via the QR code that Christina pointed out earlier. I will be navigating you through the site and its usability. So I will zoom in a little bit here and show you the home page and the main navigation menu. The main navig navigation prompts the user to find a data set, browse by theme if they're not sure what to look for, there is a how-to that explains how to use the site and how to make use of our APIs. Um, data stories are available on the site as well. In addition to making data available, we really want to make sure that we are providing examples of how this data is used to make decisions as well. So we have a number of data stories available. Learn More is a non-exhaustive list of all the external data, um, data hubs that are peace and security related that are not produced by us. So these include examples like ACLID and CIPRI and other UN entities as well, like OCHA and World, and, uh, World Bank. And finally, the About page is just a little about us, and there is a Contact Us button as well if you wish to contact us directly. The home page repeats this. Initially, you will see a prompt to find a data set, as well as the total number of data sets available on the publicly facing site right here. We hope to double this in the next year. And then if you scroll down, you will see a preview of a few of the data stories that we have available. We also have, again, a prompt on how to use the database. And if you're not sure what you're looking for, you can explore our data themes. So let's think of a particular scenario. Um, let's say we are looking at political stability in Somalia, a topic that we frequently report on and member states typically ask us about. This tool would help us in that larger conversation by building a narrative. How would we do this? If we go to our themes and look at, for example, peace building, this will take us to the find a data set page with the peace building theme filtered and show us the data set results that are tagged with this theme. Now we can change the themes tagged. We can select conflict prevention, for example, or Security Council Affairs. We can also filter our data sets based on the countries or areas tagged in the data set, i.e. mentioned in the data set, or in the missions covered by the data set. All of this can be cleared. And then once we select a data set that we would like to look at, in this case, like I said, we're looking at political stability in Somalia, we might decide to look at all the peace building fund projects that are taking place there. Once we click on a data set, we have a number of tabs that appear. The first one is what we're calling metadata. This is simple data about the data set. It's a description of it. It explains how frequently it's updated, how far back it goes, and then any limitations and exceptions that we have regarding this data set, as well as all the themes that it's tagged with, all the tags that it's given that allow us to filter it on the main page. If we're not yet ready to download the data set, we have a data preview tab. This allows us to scroll through and take a look at the columns and the rows available in the data set. Now frequently, column names are not necessarily very self-explanatory, and sometimes values are not either. 
And for this reason, we have a definition tool available at the bottom of this page. So if we're not sure exactly what the context of a column name is, we have asked the data providers to give us definitions, just to give a little bit more context. Third, we have a visualize tab. This is where we really get creative. So in this case, we are showing where all the Peace Building Fund um, countries are, and then also what the focus areas of each are, with the size of the, of the circle showing the amount spent. Um, this can be any different dashboard. It really gives the data provider a way to tell a story. We also have a download button. The download allows the user to download a snapshot of the data in CSV, JSON, or XML, depending on what kind of analysis they're doing. And then we also have APIs, which I will dive into in a minute once I show you the last tab. The Discover More tab is a tab that, in, that tells people that if they've looked at one data set, they may also be interested in this one and this one as well. Here are a few blogs that we have written that have to do with this data set. And if you still haven't found what you need, here are a couple of external complementary data sources that might give you the data you need as well. Now I'm just going to come back to our APIs really quickly since this is a World Data Forum and we really want to show off the technical part of this tool. So what we've done is we've generated APIs for each of our data sets, the public ones especially. And if one were to take the data set ID and plug it into our API structure, which is explained in our how-to page, then they can have direct access to the back-end data from the database. So an API looks like that in XML. Now it's refreshing. So if one, an analyst, for example, looking into political stability in Somalia were to take this API and copy it and then plug it in to Power BI or Excel or any other analytical tool by going to get data from web, then what that would do is that would connect the data from our databases directly to their report, allowing them to generate a report like the one you see in front of you and then not need to come back to the site to update it. So if we're looking at Somalia, this is more information on the Peace Building Fund. What we can do is we can go to Somalia on the list. In this case, I have removed Somalia on the list. I'm gonna try that again. And I can zoom in and I can see exactly what pro projects we have and exactly what's being spent on each of them. Instead of having to go back to the site and update this in six months time, I can simply click refresh and the API would update this data directly. All of our public data sets on the Data Hub right now have this API built in. And I was here. And I highly encourage and invite you to look through all of our data sets. This is only phase one of the Data Hub. We hope to, as I said, grow the total number of data sets. We also have a login function. function. So anyone with a UN.org email address can log in and access even further data sets. That is all from me. Back over to you, Martin and Christina. Thanks so much, Joanna. And as mentioned, there are two tiers here in the Data Hub. Uh, the first tier is the public-facing one, which is data that is uh, for public consumption that is already mostly released to the public. So the Hub really serves the function of a hub by pooling those data sets together that are, you know, existed in different parts of the peace and security pillar. So that's kind of one added value here to have one stop uh, shop system. Uh, but then we also have many colleagues working in missions and, and other parts of the departments that didn't have their dedicated data space yet. So for them, it provides an infrastructure to have a safe place to, uh, to make this data available to the public. And the second tier, as Joanna just showed, is really for UN colleagues only data sets that are not released, released to the public, but where we want to have easy access to them. So that allows us to um, you know, be more efficient, but also to you know, connect the dots better. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists for the discussion. Uh, we will hear some initial thoughts from them, and then later on open up uh, the room for, for questions you know, from the audience, from you. And we invite you to use the chat function throughout the conversation to raise any questions you might have, and we will revert to them during the Q&A session. Now, our first speaker is Dr. Tiernat Reilly, who is a professor of political geography and conflict at the University of Sussex. Uh, she is a political geographer, and her work is focused mainly on conflict governance and the social consequences of climate change. Uh, she also directs the Armed Conflict Look 
location and event data, uh, commonly known as ACLET, which tracks local conflict events uh, in, in over 50 countries around the world. And I think her, her research has been very unique. I think about her work on political geography of work and the spatial analysis of civil war violence, or a recent article she published on hired guns using pro-government militias for political competition in terrorism and political violence. Uh, we're very happy that you're with us, Leonor, and uh, the floor is all yours. Over to you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure. It's a pleasure to be invited. Of course, I've, I've seen the Peace and Security Data Hub recently, and I think that the initiatives overall of the UN to support the Secretary General's data program are really impressive, and they've been very quick to, to come on board, which I think is really important. Um, I'm sure that we'll see several iterations of how this might look both within and outside the UN, and this is a really excellent example of what people should aspire to, to in order to get out more transparent and useful information. So thank you very much for the invitation and also for the demonstration of the Peace and Security Data Hub. So. Um, I'm from ACLED, which is an organization outside of the UN body, but who effectively deals uh, many, many times with, uh, with different UN initiatives. And I just wanted to note at the moment where I really thought that the future of this initiative might lead to, or an initiative similar to it, and link it to another initiative that, uh, that ACLED is also associated with called CRAFT, which is an ability to support the ecosystem of data that is used by the UN and other practitioners, especially, in order to make sure that those that we are using consistently are sustained over time. So I think one of the first challenges with uh, any data set or any data project is, is both finding the audience that's able to use the data that you are providing and can access those data consistently. Because it, it, it takes, as, as we all know, quite a long time to um, manipulate data and understand what it has to offer you and then use it in your own work. And that type of data literacy that is central, I think, to a central building block to more effective data use is, uh, is thankfully taken very seriously now by, by many, especially within development, uh, the, the development area. So um, I would really commend uh, anybody to take on the the ability to improve data literacy amongst users and and the way in which the peace and security data hub has been established and what it offers is I think a really perfect way to emphasize that there are multiple types of users and some users would really appreciate visualizations and knowledge and a common language through which to learn more about how to use that data. And this is a, a really good example about how you can then scale up to using your own data, manipulating those data for, for the questions you hope to ask. So the other thing that I would say about this initiative more broadly is that, and CRAFT also, is that it really encourages alignment between data sets that are not necessarily covering the same thing, but are also required in many ways to work together to answer a bigger question. So ACLED produces uh, data on political violence and demonstrations. It, it can answer a very particular set of questions that are often one of many that are being asked within practitioner communities. And so being able to access other data such as development aid data or needs data, or even ways that we can assess early warning is particularly important to, I think, the users, um, the users of all of our sets. Um, I would also really advocate for people to, to think more about how data are useful to people on the ground. As, as Martin noted, it, it's very important for these data not only to be accessible, but also reference and also be um, actionable by people who need to um, to do something with them. So at ACLED, we recently started um, an early warning research hub, and the, the initiative there is really pushed by the idea that prediction data or prediction studies often are asking questions at such a high level that they're not actionable by people on the ground. But when we know more about both intensity and volatility of active conflict spaces, it can tell us quite a number of things that are usable to practitioners, including whether or not food aid will be needed, whether or not you're, you should be expecting IDPs, both in, in that space or, close, or closely outside of it, 
um, whether or not security teams are needed, whether or not budget needs to, budgets need to be changed. These are the very practical questions that people face. And I think that with more disaggregated data and more open access data, we can start asking and answering those questions in a way that's particularly useful to the people on the ground, which will be great. Um, as I said before, I think that uh, quite a lot of this is quite a lot of our first job is is assessing and creating a common language and an alignment between data sets. And what I would really caution against is um, is becoming too focused on the science fiction of AI or complicated models and instead um, really take the low hanging fruit here, which is the accessibility and the usability of data sets to new users, but also to more established uh, communities that simply need new information and um, and seeing what that can yield. Because my, my own assessment and the assessment of some of my team here in this room is that that actually has tremendous yield. And again, it's very usable. One of the things I think that has been sometimes missed in the in the search for uh, new AI tools or more complicated tools is that it has to be usable to kind of our our most common um, our most common community members, and that needs to be um, at a level and a scale that is again with a common language and also um, with with pretty straightforward and simple tools and a, and a usability factor. So uh, quite a lot of the qualitative and rich information that comes from field um, monitors or field staff or people with a lot of knowledge about different conflict contexts should also be integrated as much as possible. And why it may not be measurable in the same way that we're discussing here in the same in, in the same format, it nonetheless together gives us a much richer understanding of what's happening in these unstable environments than simply using um, data itself. So. So both uh, a broader community, a more usable, um, a more usable set of data for for this broader community, and of course a language that we can speak to each other so that we uh, we can address each other's needs. That's what I'll say at the moment. Thank you again very much for the opportunity. I'm really really thrilled about this direction. Thank you so much. Our second speaker is Dr. Slava Jenkin Mikhailov. Uh, he's a professor of data science and public policy at the Herdy School of Governance in Berlin. And at the Herdy School, he's a director of the Data Science Lab, a new initiative to advance data science teaching and, and research. And uh, he has done fascinating work. We have collaborated with him on um, a great uh, data set he created uh, with regard to the General Assembly debate. Uh, and uh, I can also highly recommend an article he wrote on treating words as data with error, estimating uncertainty in text statements of uh, policy positions. Um, uh, Slava, we're very happy to have you with us. Uh, the floor is all yours. Over to you. Thank you. And uh, thank you as well for the invitation. It's an excellent opportunity to discuss um, what I think I agree with, Linda. It's an amazing um, thing that you're launching the tool. And, um, one thing I would uh, immediately jump into the conversation and saying that uh, taking on what Clint was saying, that I'm all for simple tools and common language, but coming from the data science uh, side and specific applications of data science in public policy, in government, one thing that is my work is showing that it's also that um, there's an abundance of data that is currently underutilized uh, in government and the specific type of data that is underutilized and over, often overlooked. But at the same time, the data that is really labor intensive if you apply standard approaches as we do it now in government is uh, textual data. It's data, all the treaties, all the peace treaties that, um, that are actually part of your collection as well. All these documents are currently being analyzed by human beings reading them and trying to tag them, um, annotating them. and it's labor intensive, it's intent research intensive, but at the same time, it doesn't come, it doesn't scale well. It doesn't scale to all potential peace treaties that you might have in the database. But if you go to more administrative, so the back end of UN peacekeeping affairs, it you cannot do that at scale. That would provide you with sufficient detail and information that is quick enough to be useful for decision making process. And this is one thing that I was like, one thing that I wanted to note in this introductory statement is that there, 
new tools and uh, that can be applied, natural language processing that can be applied, but actually what we are doing is applying it to existing data, data that has been collected historically and often underutilized. And we can bring new resources, new tools to capture and generate new insights that, and this is where the challenge comes in, not simply generating new insights, but actually trying to make them useful for decision-making process, so embedding them in decision-making process. And that's the complicated part, that's the challenging part. And I think this is something that we'll discuss later today about the challenges. But one thing I would say is that um, what Martin mentioned, that, that the work that we've been doing, uh, focusing on textual data, trying to identify what it can be used for, that's one aspect where I think new tools can be useful. Machine learning, natural language processing, um, whatever we want to call AI, but at least like going for the individual technologies of machine learning and natural language processing, we can generate things at scale that couldn't be done easily before. And we are at the level of maturity with these new technologies where this can be deployed and it is being deployed in governments around the world and international organizations around the world to make better sense of all the program reports, project reports that flow in, thousands of pages of documents that are being now analyzed uh, without replacing human decision task, the officers who are working on these cases without replacing them, but helping them focus on some things that need to be focused. Linking different projects together, identifying similar semantic patterns across different projects and linking them together, which gives additional insights that otherwise would have been overlooked by simply focusing on individual siloed approaches. And I think the the way that you are setting it up all in one database that um, one thing that going to the future that can be this additional layer, analytical layer that allows you to tab different data sets that you currently have across the data and linking them up for additional insights and additional analytics. So from new types of data, um, to competences that probably need to be developed, and we can talk about competences later, but competences like natural language processing and machine learning, new competences that need to be developed uh, in the UN, to actually uh, thinking about linking things together in an analytical layer for the data that is being presented to make it even more useful um, for people um, who are working in the field. So I think this is just uh, one, one one aspect, one view coming from my work, and I'm happy to explore that uh, further as we go along in this conversation today. So, thank you, Martin. Thank, thanks so much to both of you. Uh, I give the audience to to come up with uh, a few other questions, but let me just quickly respond just to make this a conversation between us, uh, so it doesn't become just a panel. But I, I heard from from Cleonora the you know uh, the comment on you know the science fiction of artificial intelligence. You know, keep it real. I heard from you. You know, it's important to collect data, uh, to have it, sufficient data for decision making and, and think about the usability as well. And from Slava, I heard from you the, the opportunities of scale. So I wonder, as a question to, back, to both of you, you know, aren't we moving towards an era where we have too much data at hand, and where we don't know what to do with it anymore, right? Because we were in an era where we were craving for a more systematic approach. And, and we were craving for, you know, the opportunity to connect the dots. And, you know, you, you talked about the, this integrated way of analysis as well, drawing from humanitarian issues, political economy issues, you know, like the complexity of that. But is that still manageable, you know? And if you can think like five, ten years ahead where text mining is so much more available, speech to text analysis so much more available, you know, will we rather drown than, than float? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, thanks. That's a great question. Um, what I would say is that, for for the for the typical user, I think um, the availability of all these tools is is great, but it's not something that they're likely to um, employ within their own life. They may in fact want it to be summarized in a in a in a way where you basically get a weekly brief or you get a visualization or you get a map. For the more for the more analytical user, of course, I don't think that more data is a problem. It's just the availability of those data, how quickly they're updated, how systematic they are. And so the, sometimes the issue with creating a data set is that those two user bases, if, if not more, need to be equally managed and, um, 
and appeal to in many ways. So, so rather than me thinking that somebody in South Sudan requires uh, training in data analytics, I would be much more um, likely to send a list of where we think that um, the volatility in certain villages are, is above and beyond what we would expect in the last two months. And so we would expect more violence there in the next five weeks. That to me seems a much more usable way to take the huge amount of both data and analytical skill and, and provide it to the end user in a way that um, is is a, is a good reference point for them, but also um, they can make their own decisions without being paralyzed by the inability to kind of wade through what to us is is a pretty, pretty normal, let's say, library of information and we can pick and choose and we can figure out ways that they can be aligned. But to somebody who doesn't do this every day is probably quite paralyzing. Um, I, I would add that if we think of where we been with technology over the last 20 years, and I'm talking about analytical technology, right? We started off with really coding, hard coding things, and it was pretty complicated 20 years ago to code even a simple machine learning estimate. And this is just an example. We're not talking about machine learning being useful, but um, just as a simple example, and where we are now with the ease of use of a lot of libraries available. So this the layer of analytics is becoming more and more user friendly. So my, it's a, protected analogy coming, uh, I'm getting to the point now that I, I think that the, the, we're not really going to face the death by 1,000 data sets thrown at you, but what we probably will see in parallel is evolution and further development of this analytical layer that is put on top of the data sets. Exactly what Clinton is saying, that there will be something that is useful uh, for, for an officer in South Sudan, you and your own officer in South Sudan, but we will probably arrive at a point where we have, let's say, the same 1,000 data sets with an analytical layer where a lot of this has been taken uh, and done and prepared in an easy way. And we've seen this development um, over the last decade, and it's been tremendous even over the last couple of years, and it's getting better and better, it's getting more and more user-friendly. And I think this level of automation of analytics or automation, not in a way of creating the analysis for somebody, but making it easy to do, I think that's where we're going to get. So there will be more and more data available, but there will also be parallel development of better tools being available. So a decade ago, we didn't talk about Power BI, we didn't talk about Tableau, but now we are using it. Um, and similar will be with more analytical uh, layer for the data sets. That's what I would say. If I could just pop in there for a second and agree wholeheartedly with Slava, um, and also to say that, you know, with the availability of more disaggregated and more um, accessible data, we can actually answer the questions that these people in South Sudan or the people in the central offices of many international organizations have had, rather than saying, I will predict that Somalia will be violent for the next three years. We can say a much more nuanced, precise and accurate interpretation of exactly what type of instability people are likely to face rather than more kind of academically informed but ultimately far less useful uh, conclusions because of because of the democ democratization of, of the use and and the availability uh, one example that actually from Martin's work and one example that Martin showed me is the it's the peacemaker right the peacemaker dot un dot org so it's bringing all this peace agreements together and making it useful for people for people working on peace agreements to understand and to link them together but this is one example of a lot of separate data sets now being united together and allowing them to all link together find commonalities find things that can be useful, but also these additional insights. And I think that's one thing that we will see more and more, things like that, um, the ease of use will develop. I'm gonna jump in here because I have on my mind and there's lots of conversations going on internally about how we both transform the organization, but also move leverage like both of you were saying it you know what we have better i think there was a kind of a, a reality check moment 
uh, as we generated the UN's data strategy, that in fact we had not a paucity of data and information, but a wealth, but we weren't leveraging it properly. I guess my question is really for both of you, because you've touched on so many things that essentially we need to do in parallel, right? We need to look at the tools and 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 use them to the best of, and and use them well you know differentiating between sort of deterministic algorithms and ai and learning learning algorithms that's a, that's a thing that must be done and and just having good clean data and all the practices around governance and cataloging and and sharp definitions and good processes while also recognizing there's a challenge on decision making and and linking together the right insights to the decision forums that essentially can act on those all of these things essentially have to happen in parallel in fact right so i guess one question that is on the minds internally and it would be helpful to get your insight would be um you know if we're moving towards early warning and an identification of risks that the UN can respond to or advise member states or support member states in their decision making processes essentially you know what would you what would you see the UN doing to prepare for early warning analytics and and predictive models what should we do over to both of you Slav if you'd like to go first please go ahead I've I've uh, I've been doing that since we began. So if you prefer not to go first, I'm also happy to. <laughs> yeah, 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 go ahead. That's fine. Yeah. Um, that's a really tricky question, in part because the UN has two roles, which are um, in some ways quite contradictory. In one sense, it's a neutral body that is engaging with crisis and uh, crisis locations and, and situations and populations in crisis. Well, at the other end, it's a political body and it must engage with the politics of its member states. And um, if we've learned anything, it's that they don't particularly appreciate being told that they are unstable and or more or less prone to, um, to having their own crises and, and the manifestations or how that will manifest in, in general. And so um, I would say that uh, at a working level, so that kind of at the office level of, of what's happening, an early warning system uh, that can prepare people for the likelihood of, of swift changes is particularly useful to consider. Um, and also uh, different manifestations than they're typically used to. I mean, from an academic background, I can say that the way that we've understood uh, crises is often extremely narrow. And so it's not particularly helpful for people who must deal with um, a climate crisis, a migration crisis, a conflict crisis, a political crisis, simultaneously in the same space, and what that might mean for for um, for humanitarian aid, or 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 for even the politics around it. Um, and I would imagine that what we're all working towards is ways to advise people to to live up to their their expectation of not doing harm and protecting and providing for the citizens within within those scenarios outside of the politics of this context, which um, is extremely messy as we've as we've uh, seen recently this week. Um, and one of the one of the key ways I think to do that is to retain some independence in terms of how the data are collected and who's analyzing it from the political entities that um, that that we're looking into. Um, in order to make sure that um, that we can provide the most, as I said before, kind of precise, accurate, robust information on risk, which is already kind of an uncertain um, area, uh, to practitioners and, of course, to the civilian populations as possible. Um, but I think that where information is not necessarily as useful as people wish it were, is at the political level. So when, when people are engaging with conversations about the instability or the unstable streams within states, it's not met with, um, with assurances that the data are robust as to why Ethiopia might be experiencing a continued and complex crisis. Um, that's much more, I think, at the practitioner level, where those data are more useful rather than at the political level. And so I would say that the data and the information have to be wielded in the right scale in order to have the best impact. 
and Slava? So for, for my take, so first of all, I just wanted to make one comment, comment that you, Christina, you mentioned that the cataloging of data and you realize how much data you have and all the complexities that come with this. One thing I was going to say, and this is uh, one of the more general comments that I wanted to make today is cataloging the data and making it available in the catalogs, as Martin showed and um, as Joanna showed with the uh, hub, this is only one part of a story you want to tell. And I really appreciate what you're doing with the uh, data stories, like the blogs that you have with, uh, with the data sets. But another part is um, there's been over the last maybe five years, there's discussion about data sheets for data sets. So every data set is being accompanied by more detailed information that goes slightly at the at different layer of things that are related to the data set. It's from motivation. What is the motivation behind the data set? What is the composition of the data set? Um, collection process. So, and they're also showing the recommended users. I haven't seen the blogs that you mentioned, so maybe you're covering those things there. But what I wanted to to say is that there's additional layers um, to data usage, to cataloging the data that make them more relevant, but also that allow us to unpick some of the potential biases that can come in with the data. And that relates to, um, early warning systems with a lot of data coming in, if we bring it into the decision-making process, we have to be pretty clear about um, what biases, whatever we define under the bias, even in the data collection, in the coverage, in social demographics being covered, geographical bias, whatever comes in, we need to be absolutely clear about the limitations of that data, but also we need to cover the things like like the expectations of what, what was the data collected for? What was the motivation behind the initial collection of the data? And that relates to third party data primarily, I guess, that is being collected, but that might be quite useful for um, early warning systems. Uh, composition of the data, the types of data, but also um, the collection process. And maybe in the blogs you're covering the recommended use cases, but it can be another thing because you don't want to have the data that is used for um, for different purpose than the one that was intended for. And that's another thing that with the early warning that uh, system. Um, but this is more on the data side and just making sure that whatever the early warning system is created, whatever goes in, the input is actually as correct as possible. And thinking about the output, and this is related directly to your question. So um, my experience would be from um, these things on the national state level. So early warning systems for individual states have been involved in developing some of them, and advising on the development of some of them. Uh, there it's the complexity is how to embed it in the decision-making process and the usual organizational changes and you just cannot avoid organizational change that comes with these new tools that are being put forward. Uh, and that's from the, the things that I've seen, that's the biggest thing. How do you adopt existing process to take this new input of data? Anything from the base of data coming in, early warning system needs to be quick when it comes in, but you need to then adjust the decision-making process to be more agile. Uh, and this agility and decision-making process is just it's more complicated to do in some organizations than in others. And I wouldn't know much about the internal decision-making process in the UN to, to even characterize it. Uh, but I think that's one aspect. So from the data input to actually the step after the predictions are made, how do you embed it in decision-making process even before it goes to the political um, leaders, like even internally with a UN um, offices, how do you embed this to help them make it better? And yeah, and that's, I think it's a complicated issue, but it's also, it might seem that it's removed from the data science side, from the data side, but for me, I think it's, it's an integral component of the pipeline from data to insights and to decision making. I really appreciate the answers of both of you. They're very thoughtful. Um, I'm hearing that essentially a couple of key things that we all need to be aware of um, as we 
begin to ramp up, let's just say like a giant data infrastructure to pump data into decision-making processes is really an understanding of context. Um, I think that's your point, Kleena, at large, is the contextual environment, the dynamics of the decision-making processes themselves and the way insights kind of intersect with those decision forums really matters. Um, and then, Slava, I'm hearing from you also that an awareness of bias and an understanding that that is going to be a continual concern that we need to factor into the way that we approach our evolution um, is going to, yeah, that's a concern that we're going to have to just have an eye on and keep track of is, you know, we don't know what we don't know. If we don't, we haven't even necessarily ramped up this supply chain of data, we won't necessarily have even a methodology to, to understand our bias, but it's something we have to keep an eye on. And I really appreciate both of those points as we begin to um, and thank you, Kleena, so much for mentioning CRAF, the new fund that I understand is imminently ready to be launched uh, to essentially support, we hope for years, um, the projects that are, are tackle these issues specifically on data technology and digital um, evolution in, in the UN and beyond. Uh, but the, an understanding of bias, I, I think, is probably an excellent point to, to bring out. I hope that we we continue to have these dialogues so that we can continue to learn together, actually. Um, Martin, I'm wondering if we should, if, if I could turn it back to you or if we should turn to some of the questions I see for Klina and Slava, there, there's actually quite a number of questions that have been popping up from the audience. But maybe back to you, Martin. Absolutely, yeah. So we have been trying to answer some of the technical questions with regard to the Data Hub directly in the chat. So I hope some of them were addressed. Um, I would turn to Joanna just to see whether questions came up on Hoover, the platform that is used for the World Data uh, Forum. Joanna, any questions um, from there? Thank you, Martin. There is one question on Hoover asking if the hub will also include official statistics, SDGs, and data from governments, e.g. conflict-related deaths, homicide, human rights defenders, and military spending. Um, to which just the simple answer is uh, that this data hub is intending to make available data that is collected by the peace and security pillar of the United Nations. And so our aim is not to duplicate data that is already available elsewhere. Um, it's really just to make available the data and streamline through a single pipeline the data that is collected by our own departments. Um, that is the only one on Whova, so attendees, please feel free to also use Whova to ask questions as well, and we will relay them to the speakers. But uh, back over to you, Martin and Christina, if you'd like to add anything onto that. Yeah, I was, I was wondering whether we can dream for a minute. You know, I heard I heard uh, clear not on kind of the necessity for curation, right? Uh, when we have so much data at hand, we need to curate it carefully to make it digestible. And I, I heard Slava very clearly on you know, the opportunities because the tech becomes so much more intuitive. You know, we talked about different dashboards and, you know, think about um, tagging text, you know, for name recognition, for instance. Uh, this is much easier nowadays than even a year ago. The technology has become so intuitive that it can become playful to, you know, in a crowdsourcing effort, uh, tag text to, to do text mining projects that you described. So I wonder whether we can dream for a minute, you know, in an ideal world, if I can start with my dream, you know, we would indeed have this supra infrastructure where, you know, the different data nodes are automatically connected so that indeed, and it came up in the chat here, you know, we wouldn't have those different data islands, HDX for humanitarian data, where everybody can upload things, it's not really vetted, or data.un.org, which is more, you know, uh, um, development related data, but you know it's also very hard to to find the dis, you know the difference between where does peace and security data start, where does humanitarian data end, you know. So uh, and, and uh, in my ideal dream, this would be automatically connected, you know, so that I, I don't have to think about it. it. Would be you know organically uh, always search for nodes and create kind of this this neural net of, of of collected data. But then I I also have a nightmare in my dream. And my nightmare is that people are not even ready or able to hold the chart correctly. And I had a conversation with Slava about this when, when we met in a, in a place in Europe. I'm not going to reveal the place in Europe where we met uh, quite recently, where 
you know, uh, in 2021, and I think we met in August, uh, you have to fax a document from one place to the other instead of emailing it or attaching an Excel file. You know, and imagine how much sensitive data can get lost when you, you know, fax a document and you have to put it back into your own data system and all of that in 2021. So in my dream of the future, it might be a, not such a distant future, five, 10 years, I, I believe much of that will remain reality, you know, of, of the data nightmares uh, where the human factor is an enabling factor, but also uh, an erroneous factor. So I wonder if I invite both of you and or all three of you, Christina, of course, as well, you know, if you if you dream about, you know, the future 10 years from now, five years from now, how would that look like, you know, and what abilities would we have? Um, what would pop up in your mind? Slava, you want to start? You're smiling, so you want to start? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, I mean, for me, let, since we're dreaming, let me just go for the dream that I have, uh, is that uh, we, in 10 years' time, well, if we're dreaming, let's say five years' time, we finally solve the data sharing issue. And we can easily share data, and it's all legal, and we don't need to do any illegal stuff to share data between different organizations. But, hell, uh, if we're dreaming, even within the same organization, between different departments in the same organization, we can actually start sharing data easily. And we know that we can trace the provenance of the data. We know that the data privacy uh, is protected. We know that the security sensitivity of the data, it's all there. Um, so that would be like the solution to data sharing uh, would be like the dream that I have. And again, just like you, I have a nightmare scenarios that this is not resolved. And this been haunting me working with governments is that sharing the data just will never get resolved. Uh, absolutely satisfactorily for their law department, right? You think that you resolved it, and there's always some lawyer in the law department who says, actually, well, according to this and this paragraph, it's actually not resolved. So my dream is that data sharing is resolved. And um, I am not even going to go into the 20 years into the future where the analytical layer is fully automated and all these models are running seamlessly and quick enough that uh, you don't even need to think what type of um, high-level architecture you need to deploy. It's all done quickly. Um, yeah, so that would be really fine to the future, but the data sharing would be the immediate dream for the next five years. Lena? Great, thanks very much. That that would be really nice. <laughs> be really, really nice. Um, so I have two dreams. One I think is is well, I hope I would imagine that I hope both of them are achievable, um, but n they're not good news. Well, one of them is decent, but um, the, so the first is that I would hope that our geography becomes much better, as in our our ability to um, to compile information by geography is 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 far more improved than it is at the moment. And um, and that has like some very very easy things to overcome, but for some reason are, are um, impossible to, to, to note at the moment um, any improvements. And that includes things like having a, a um, subnational administration list that actually matches the one that the country uses or the UN uses or, the, or that's popularly available or publicly available because all of those lists are drastically different as are their borders, as are their populations, all the rest of it. So, and it makes any attempt to understand um, locational risk, very difficult uh, when people are using drastically different um, data for the exact same phenomena, which is effectively a territorial container. So I know um, that people at HDX and I have talked about this at length. There's about three different, I think, UN um, research groups just on administrative districts. And I don't know if they speak to each other or they're unable to kind of get great information constantly updated, but it's it's a constant issue. And I think that it's a very achievable goal, uh, but it has so far been elusive. And the second is is a, a little bit, a, maybe a, a bit of a downer, but I'll say it anyway, um, which is that I think that we need to bound our expectations a bit. And what I mean is that I wish people understand that data will not cause peace. It won't. It's not going to lead to peace. It's not going to... It's not going to be central to uh, people um, stopping killing or fighting or whatever the case, but it can provide 
help to people who need who need it. It can give us much better ways to help people who are in need. Um, and so when we talk about the use of data, I think being clear about um, what's achievable and what's not is uh, is a goal that we really can start to to realize um, because I, I don't want people to be disappointed by by what it is they're engaging in. Um, and that I think means that they, they're going to need to bound their expectations a bit. I, I just want to echo that point, actually, Clean. I'm really glad you brought that up because I feel like also the points that you um, and Slava brought up previously about the importance of context and bias really help answer this question as well. I think, Martin, if I was to attempt to answer, it reminds me of the question I think that you um, in the Innovation Network and DPPA brought up a, a maybe a year ago, which is, you know, what kind of diplomat would you want to, would you envision in 20 years? Like, and I, for me, I like almost have to reframe the question, which is like, what superpower would you want? If you were like a superhero, what would you be? If you're like a superhero civil servant, or a superhero, you know, academic advisor, like, or a researcher, you know, what is your superpower? And I, I feel like the answer, what we don't want, right, is for the existing, especially the biases built into technical systems and the way that those two, I said, I think especially the tools and the methodologies that they inform exacerbate existing inequalities and biases speaking to, I think, especially sort of like inter subnational kind of dynamics and gender aspects. I think all of the inequalities that, um, you know, exist and, and, and do pose a huge risk of being solidified and ossified because we're, because I think especially COVID has been an accelerator in moving towards digital and, and that there's a lot of unexpected or inadvertent consequences to that in that move, in uh, simply taking our existing ways of working and then moving into digital means that we're not necessarily transforming yet, really. Um, but what I would hope is that in the superhero of the future, um, UN, if the UN is a superhero and our collective peace and security body politic is a, is a superhero, that we remain kind of ethically grounded in human concerns, right? Because what are we really trying to do here? We're trying to free up collective knowledge that is embedded in documents and data and everything that we're producing and making it better available so it can hit the right decision makers at the right time that are supported by the right analytical support mechanisms so that ins the insight can be brought so we can actualize that those values that are expressed in the Declaration of Human Rights, et cetera. And so, so con to back to your point, Kleena, about like right-sizing expectations and understanding the importance of context. So if it's the right data at the right time, <laughs> that super, super human future, context seems to be really critical to understanding how we can yeah, like how the context and how we frame that in these new tools and capabilities, um, I think is is really critical. I hope that context and the human context continues to be sort of the core of all of our concerns from the technical community um, working together on our, our common goals. But back to you, Martin. I want to pick up on a, this is a fascinating uh, conversation. I can just invite, you know, everybody else in the audience just to take a moment maybe after this event or right now to think about kind of what would be your dream, you know, uh, because what we have uh, tried to do from the beginning in this project is to, you know, keep the doors open to academia, to tech partners, and, and certainly the UN family is, is a large family with, with many, many shades and in, in many forms. Now, I wanted to come to a few questions that are in the chat, and they are about the reality, the present today, when we think about the UN as a large bureaucracy and the challenges to collaboration, you know, internally in particular, uh, but then also overcoming the hurdle of, of um, you know, uh, um, kind of data privacy and ethics and data literacies that are, that are often barriers for collaboration, right? Because if we don't know, then we are fearful and then we, we don't share. And I think a beautiful change that was created with the uh, with the SDGs data strategy is to move away from data ownership 
to uh, data stewardship. And that was something our colleagues from UNICEF actually pushed. You know, I'm happy to make this transparently because they, they have lived this for a long time. And, and big shout out to UNICEF for that, uh, you know, saying that we need to move away from the perception that we own the data, that a desk officer, a certain mission owns the data, but that we are just custodians of the data, right? We're just stewards of the data. So I wonder, Slava and Fiona, when you think about kind of those challenges that organizations, maybe not just bureaucratic organizations or public organizations, but organizations at, at large have, what it would be your advice to overcome those barriers? You know, and I know Slava, you're teaching that. You have a master's program now that just started where, where students can learn how to bring public policy and data together. And you know, you're a good example of, you know, practitioner scholarly infusion of those different challenges. So I wonder what you teach your students in that regard, but how to overcome those barriers with regard to literacy, um, you know, and, and here uh, Jamie wrote in the, in, the, in the chat also about demystifying the role of data, right? This belief that data can solve everything. Any thoughts on that? Uh, so I, I can start, Kalina, if you, if you like, if you're okay. Uh, I, can, I can just, yeah, so we, have, we just launched a new master's program, uh, Data Science for Public Policy, and the aim is specifically uh, to bring together public policy, data science, but also the third pillar that we're working on, it's uh, solution engineering. That's how we call it, right? So it's developing something for, like developing specific solutions, not simply doing a parallel stream of, we'll teach you machine learning, and a parallel stream will teach you how policy process works. But actually another one where we show you how to merge these two things together and develop a solution, whatever the solution might be. It can be developing an app for farmers in Indonesia. Uh, it can be developing something for like Mozambique, small farmers trying to borrow from larger farmers, tractor equipment, all kinds of things, right? It doesn't really matter their solution, but it can also be for governments. Um, what can you do when you are flooded by emails that are complaining about some service in the delivery? So you develop a tool that analyzes, takes the data, textual data, analyzes it, for a specific task and this and develops a specific solution and that's one thing that we found that um y tying it in to a specific things that are being faced by organizations and trying to tie in whatever this high end technical things and um, public policy things that we're discussing tying in into specific they can be quite mundane they can be quite simple they can be uninteresting um to uh, like research or academic, but tying them in, it ties them to their usage and uh, civil servants find it useful. And they that's when they get interested. If we can show that it's relating uh, to their business plan, so something that they plan to do in the next 12 months, uh, not to strategic plan, something that can be done in the next 10 years. For that, they don't really care too much. They care a bit, but not enough because they have, the, they need to deliver something in the next five months. So if we tie it in some, to something that is happening in the immediate future, something that they have to deliver anyway, and we show them that we can help them do that, that we found as the best motivator and the best way to open the doors um, for all of these things. And again, it's, it's not in the peace building setting, it's more just general public organizations, government setting, uh, where we tie it in and we're working on yeah. Well, that was very interesting. Um, so I'm going to pick up on something that Martin mentioned about data stewardship, uh, which is a great way to put it. I think that at ACLED, um, I think that we've always had the idea that information should be public and a common good, a public good, uh, rather than being siloed or um, behind a paywall or inaccessible to any number of different types of organizations or communities who need it. Um, and that, that, has, that has tremendous benefits, having a, a public good interpretation of, of uh, information accessibility. But, um, but what we deal with in terms of the stewardship is, is how people may misuse or misinform based on available information and who's who's liable for that misinformation or that misuse and it's something that we've been struggling with quite a bit um, because the last the last thing anybody wants to do is to um, is to limit use because of the varied ways in which people depending on their situation or context require it 
but at the same time, um, you don't want to be a party to a, I would say, a huge threat in this in this arena, which is um, misuse and misinformation or disinformation. And so, um, so being a steward really requires quite a lot of management on that front, rather than rather than as as we talked about before, the research design and the the uh, being clear about your agenda and being updating your sources and making sure that it's accessible to other. Uh, data providers and making sure it's accessible to other data sets, et cetera. All of those issues, which um, are very important governance and uh, methodological issues, are now um, are now pillars where where preventing misinformation through stewardship is also uh, becoming increasingly important. Can I? I just want to go back to a question that, that Jamie posed. I'm just going to read it out for everybody because there's more in there. I would love to hear your thoughts because that's. Uh, or Jamie, do you do you feel uh, comfortable uh, unmuting yourself and ask the question because I think it's really, really worth to do a deep dive on that. Would you be comfortable? Yeah, I won't turn my uh, internet on just because of bandwidth issues. But um, ultimately, let me see if I can find the question here. So um, yeah, my name is Jamie Megan. I'm actually seconded military officer in the Office of Military Affairs. So. I work on a lot of the future, you know, unmanned air systems, technologies, and data is a, uh, a perennial issue that's kind of, you know, wrapping around in the acquisition intelligence community. Um, and I guess one of the things I, um, I hone in on my question is, um, in terms of cultural shifts, cultural reprogramming, demystify, demystifying um, the role of data, power of data, and the fear of data, what can we do to help drive those efforts? And Really, it's about educating, I think, and how do we get to um, working with member states and leaders to help them understand enough, I think, the points that have been made about um, not over-promising a really, uh, you know, apt, uh, because I think by demystifying and, and um, trying to help them understand more, we can maybe push along the financial and political supports that we need to push along the technology, um, which is a, a clearly a sorely needed uh, topic right now, so thanks. And then maybe if I can pull in also, um, Aham, if you're still there, um, I saw a point uh, that relates also to the, you know, the culture uh, in the organization. Um, would you mind uh, coming in on that, if you like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, essentially, what I'm, um, uh, what I'm trying to get at is that in my experience, and uh, you know, uh, you know this more than anyone, is that there's a hard Sort of bureaucratic incentives not to share uh, a data in a lot of contexts, especially if the data is directly pertaining to your own mandate or uh, the achievement of your own or success of your own office. And then um, uh, the question is like, uh, is that changing? I, I understand that the stewardship moving away towards a, a stewardship approach to, to looking at this is really uh, is really helpful, I think. But uh, does it change or how, in your experience, in establishing this, uh, have you seen sort of a change where these kind of bureaucratic incentives are not as pronounced or, or a way to navigate around them to make sure that the default is that you share your data? Yeah. And then uh, uh, rather than actually going out head in hand, asking them to, to submit their, their information, because then it oftentimes, you know, gets um, gets very sensitive or can quickly get very sensitive. Uh, so that's just like uh, related to the, the bureaucratic incentive to have like a, a sharing culture within the within the organization. And thanks to both of you. No, it makes me also mindful of the three steps that um, you know are always suggested in innovation. First, you create an infrastructure. Second, you create capacity, and thirdly, you scale. Right. So infrastructure. That's why the data hub was created as an infrastructure to place data, connect things. Capacity is about literacy. When you use the infrastructure, you learn how to use it, you become much more literate with regard to the nuances. And then scale, so it's not just a niche effort that you know a few missions and a few uh, entities carry, but, but that, that transforms the whole organization, right? And that becomes a, a culture shift. Slava and, and, and also Christina, any thoughts on how to better trigger, accelerate, you know, nurture that culture shift? Maybe I can come in briefly and then turn it over to our to our guests. But we were just talking about this with um, colleagues in sort of the innovation community yesterday about you know all of the tricks of the trade to trigger change that is, include a, a wide range of behaviors and really tapping into behavioral science a bit. Um, 
But you know, everything from name and fame and, and understanding how even those that, if you understand, you know, maybe broadly speaking, a body of people that need to undergo change as being composed of sort of first leader, thought leaders, sort of the agnostics, and then, you know, those that are a little bit more of a hard case, um, what you want to do is really trigger that body in the middle, right? And, and using all of the, all of the methods to convince, to, you know, essentially present logical arguments, to humor, to charm, to name and fame, you know, there's a variety of techniques essentially to kind of trigger or catalyze the critical mass that you need to, to, to move to show that the entirety is moving forward. I think you're absolutely right. Like the, what the data hub isn't yet, but we're building towards. Um, and I, I would count ACLID and, and many of the other external um, resources that we use. You know, what we're trying to do is build up a kind of an infrastructure, just the infrastructure, so that then we can use that good, clean source of water to feed an audience that asks larger questions and builds up that larger analytical capacity to get at good decision making, right? We don't yet have that capacity. I think we're building towards it. But to your question, I am. Um, I think this is part of that wave of change. The, we got so far so quickly, obviously using the COVID moment, I think, as a kind of a funny accelerator, but but certainly it's part of that wave of change that in fact has already started and we're riding the wave of it in a way. Um, and through, the, I think, the leadership of the Secretary General in his office, um, certainly it really has made a difference to have a, a leader, a vision, someone who's uh, really unafraid to out, set out expectations in, even from a high level. And I would imagine with counterparts in member states to say, no, this is the way that we have to proceed. We really have to re-engineer some things. It's not just about having good conversations. We're actually really great at data storytelling and the peace and security pillar. We've been doing it from the outset. It's actually the infrastructure that's that has been some of the missing pieces because um, diplomacy was never really set up as a data-driven enterprise. Uh, so we're kind of missing a few pieces, but we can catch up. I think this is part of a wave of change. That would be a short answer. That would be maybe not such a short answer, but an answer to part of that. Maybe um, if I could turn it to either Klina or Slava to, to pick up on that. Um, I don't know how you've seen some of these change efforts being successful, sort of critical factors. Um, well, thanks very much for that. Just coming from... Um, an external entity, I would say that one of the things that um, that we face that I think does need to change is our ability to um, cooperate with others, similar but not entirely overlapping types of organizations. And um, I think the fear that has held a lot of external organizations back is the ability to sustain themselves if, if their work looks too similar or too like or a repetition of others. Um, and I would say that, that for example, craft goes a long way to kind of solving one of those um, bigger issues within that environment, uh, but at the same time, allowing for quite a lot of new data to spring and be tested and be piloted and see if it works. And I think that one of the most important things that I've learned about uh, a data project, especially within peace and security, is, is, the, is the need to be flexible to the surrounding environment both um, both administratively, but also, of course, just to, to reflect, in fact, what the what what it is you're trying to capture. So, um, and that can be very scary to to I think organizations that have been around for a long time. So, um, ACLED, for example, continuously reassesses what the conflict landscapes looks like and whether or not ACLED is accurately capturing it, rather than saying everything has to be, but based on the definition that we've always had because any change will be detrimental to our abilities to continue rather than, like I said, a reflection. But equally, the as you say, the kind of managerial, the administrative environment, the financial environment is changing just as rapidly as, as uh, the conflict environment. And I think that you have to also be willing to kind of shift to adapt to that in order to survive in a, 
in what is a what is a very volatile space at the moment. Um, I, I would just add that going back to what Martin was saying about custodian of the data and the general approach, but also linking it up to all the comments about the culture and the change. Um, you are obviously, and as everybody knows, working from outside organizations, UN is not unique, and this is the same story that is uh, being replayed across all government entities, government organizations, but I, I assume also in private sector, it's just not my experience. Um, bringing, um, building infrastructure and then building things on top of the infrastructure requires sometimes um, difficult choices to be made, but also difficult organizational things that need to be transformed. So organizational transformation as part of uh, building, moving from infrastructure building to scaling it up, that's a thing that is facing all government entities. Um, one thing that we know that is the biggest problem from implementing uh, data-driven projects is um, trust. And this is like a trust from management, public management organizational side. Trust is focusing not only about um, trusting in terms of data sharing, which is a big issue by itself, but also trust in um, the things that are coming out of those models and the things that um, the prediction that they made, so early warning systems or anything else. Uh, managers um, in organizations, talking about public organizations, they, there needs to be a level of trust in things that are being proposed. What we often see, and this is what uh, Christina, you mentioned, that Secretary General, great leadership. So what we often see in big organizations is that there's top level um, interest. So political leadership is really interested in that. We also see that bottom up, there's a lot of interest for, uh, from the ground up. And is this middle level that quite often is not interested in changing the status quo. And this requires a lot of interesting things that need to be done. And some tricks of trade are there, but nobody has been able to solve it completely. Um, in a lot of studies and organizational change, you return time and again to trust and uh, distrust for, uh, for anything, any innovation that comes in and this mis middle level management. So uh, I think like one thing that we try to do in applied projects is linking up the incentive structures and incentivizing uh, mid-level managers um, to the things that we are proposing with the data projects, incentivizing them. So linking up the internal incentives that are in place already. So you need to deliver on something. The projects that I mentioned, linking it up to a business plan, you have to deliver on that. Your KPIs are linked to that and linking up uh, data projects to that. It can be small. What we learned from working with the UK government is that small success stories, you build up on tiny, tiny projects. And when you have the small, sometimes uninteresting projects that are um, small constraint, that if something goes wrong, uh, nobody's really hurt. It doesn't end up on front pages of the newspapers, but they add up to changing this internal culture because you take the small success stories on a roadshow to other heads of departments and you show them that it can be done. So the small success stories, small projects on boring things, that what usually works and convinces uh, people. Um, so we never tried we, we, we tried and we failed going for big, shiny, interesting things. And what we found works much better is going for something that is really boring that nobody else wants to pick up. And you show that with uh, data-driven approaches, data science approaches, you can do it quicker or easier and without hurting anyone, reputationally or financially. And that's what was the biggest thing that worked for us in trying to get this to work. Uh, yeah, so linking it up to internal organizational incentives and in parallel building up new competencies. So not trying to build up new competencies, um, for example, in machine learning and NLP from the get-go, but trying to build up this coalition of supporters who can see the benefit and then do some roadshows in parallel about the new competence, things, things that they can uh, learn. So the literacy style uh, data literacy approach, doing this in parallel as the small success stories. Yeah. Well, thank you, both of you. I think those were actually wonderful concluding remarks from both of you when it comes to, you know, the transformation and, and both of you addressed the issue of trust, incentives, curation, 
dependency, you know, all those different factors that are so critical to to make the organization, um, you know, uh, uh, thrive with data and, and based on data. Um, I wanted to turn to Christina for, for, for some final remarks before we, we close the session. Uh, and, and then I'm going to say a few more words about the recording also of today's session. Over to you, Christina. Okay, well, first of all, thank you again, Klina and Slava and Martin. Thanks for having a great conversation uh, to kick off you know, a, a little bit, dig a little bit deeper into what we can potentially do, how we can collectively move forward, where are areas of we should focus on to get better and to work together, you know, essentially the UN and, and all partners um, in this peace and security area. We really appreciate taking the time for those of those of you in the audience. I think we touched on a couple of really important issues here that, that we will certainly keep in mind as we move forward um, and as this craft fund is launched, which is the, 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 the factors we need to really keep, in, keep at the top of our concerns, which is, of course, I look at it as a kind of a supply chain in a way, if we're just looking at internal UN peace and security data, um, putting aside for the question of how we all link up to answer big questions. But it's it's sort of building in the methodologies, using the best of the tools to ha and putting in place clear roles so that the data custodianship can really be understood and the good, you know, if we're setting up the aqueducts, Eventually, we can get to the Trevi Fountain and have it, you know, flowing well, and people can wish. But essentially, putting in place the right pieces of that puzzle so that the the water just flows to the people who need it, so that we can take the decisions that need to be taken. I think these are. And while though keeping in mind that, you know, at the at the tail end, those decisions are very contextual especially in peace and security, I think in a different way than other parts of the, the UN organization. The context really matters in terms of the political dynamic that needs progress, right? Um, and then a really good awareness of bias and how we need to just constantly keep an eye on that, learn from it quickly where we can, um, but always see it as not a, a completed concern. <laughs> You know, that's not a solution here. Um, it's going to be an ongoing challenge given the evolution of the tools that we're using and the constant nature of change. I think that will, I can't see an end to it at this point um, in terms of the tools and platforms, which then necessitates adjustments and practices and policies and all the rest of the infrastructural aspects. But I think what we're aiming to get to, and I hope that we continue to be able to draw on the community that's connected, um, very importantly, our guests here, but uh, the larger community so that we can get to that second level, right, which is the insights. Now that we have sort of this data factory pumping in and hopefully avoiding Martin's nightmare of like too much data, and then we don't know what to do with it. But really focus down, I think, on cleaner what you pulled on, which is like, we stay focused on the questions. What questions are we really asking here? That should be the filter by which then we can find the insight and improving hypotheses around, you know, the factors, the, the climate change, and how that factors into to, into political um, political change and 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 you know security concerns. I think having a clear understanding of the questions is also something I would take to heart and build into the way that the Peace and Security Data Hub uh, as a new you know, actor in the open data space, how we how we evolve towards that, um, really focusing on questions that member states and our good partners in civil society are asking. Is peacekeeping getting more dangerous? What's going on in the Horn of Africa? Is it getting worse or better? How is climate change factoring in? What are the subnational factors in Central Africa? You know, these are all questions that really need to help drive the next stage of evolution. But again, I just want to thank everybody for participating. Again, we are, we're coming to the table, finally, the open data table. We hope to be a good actor in this environment. Um, and thank you also to DESA, who um, has put together and organized the World Data Forum. Um, and thanks to the Secretary General, who mentioned our Peace and Security Data Hub at the outset. I just really want to um, express gratitude for all of those who got us to this place. Maybe back over to you, Martin. 
Colleagues, we are coming to an end of this event. Uh, I posted the program of the World Data Forum, and this is really an encouragement also for colleagues in political affairs that might not be so much familiar with, uh, you know, statistical issues or things that are at the, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, more far-fetched from, from the usual work. Have a look at the program. Really fascinating uh, talks uh, are happening, and, and you can join them, most of them, online. So just to, to promote the, the World Data Forum here a bit. That's, that's number one. Uh, second, big thanks to all of you out there that participated today, especially our speakers, but also the many colleagues from the field that I saw, member state that participated. Uh, we really, really appreciate that. And, and last point uh, of action, if you haven't clicked on the website yet, I'm gonna post the link one more time. You see it in our background as well. Have, have a look at the World Data, uh, at the World Data Forum, but also at the Peace and Security Data Hub. Uh, send us your comments if you have any, and we're happy to engage further. Have a wonderful day. Uh, stay healthy and then connect soon again. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.